these are not the X-Men that you know. The X-Men that you know are in, over there in that closet. There's some long boxes with pretty much every great story arc from uh, before 2000. Uh, these X-Men, quite literally and figuratively, are something different. They're clones of of the X-Men that are in my closet. Um, they, I mean, I mean that literally and figuratively because they are clones. All of, almost all of these X-Men in this book are clones that were hatched on Krakoa. There has been a little bit of speculation that these aren't exactly the clones. They aren't exactly copies of the originals. There's something's been changed. And that's pretty evident in a lot of the things that these characters do and say and the way that they act. But there are also, as I'll point out in this book, similarities to there's there's themes that they that they hang that they cling to even though almost all of these these mutants are are clones um hey everybody it's nerdicane i'm uh doing this is x-men number one uh the new series from jonathan hickman there is a part at the beginning uh it's about cyclops when he first put his his glasses on with professor x way back in the day I'm going to skip that for the copyright gods. There's a little bit of other stuff I'm going to skip for the copyright gods as well. I'm not going to spoil this whole book. I'm on board. I'm, I'm picking it up. I'm reading it. Um, this is going to be a very different pace and a very different style of X-Men books, as we've seen in House of X and Powers of X. These are... Think of the X-Men. Think of the mutants. Not, not so much the X-Men anymore. Uh, the X-Men, or the mutants, have been recognized as a nation. They're on Krakoa, the living island. Um, they've used Cypher to be able to talk to Krakoa, and it's worked out well. They've, they've created their own nation that they can sort of move, and they can grow the nation as they need it. Um, on that island, they've been hatching these these X-Men. They're clones, and it's... it's go, go read that stuff. Go, go watch the reviews on that. It'll fill you in. Um... It starts out, and you have to understand that, these, this starts out with the X-Men on the offensive. They're attacking uh, an Orcus base. Orcus is, they consider themselves to be a, uh, a conglomerate of information of the, the brightest minds, the greatest minds of uh, humanity, and they are sort of the last line of defense against mutant kinds. Uh, so you see this in this, a lot of people have criticized this, this new book as, you know, making the X-Men and making mutants, um, uh, racist and supremacist and segregationalist. And there's not a whole lot of, I can't really argue very well against that, um, in the writing of this. So you see this and it's very out of character and they're sort of, they're on the offensive, destroying this facility. Their Project Orcus is, trying to bring about a mother mold, uh, a mother mold sentinel. In almost every timeline that the X-Men have dealt with, and it's a very convoluted thing, Orcus creates a mother mold. Mother mold is this superior hive mind sentinel who brings about Nimrod. And Nimrod has come in different forms, but Nimrod in almost every timeline is the end of the X-Men, is the end of mutant kind. It's, it's such an adaptable... Uh, well-developed, almost perfect sentinel that it wipes out completely mutant kind in all the timelines where mutants have been wiped out. Um, so you get a situation where they're attacking this base and it's heavily guarded, as you would expect. And it's a coordinated attack between the X-Men and Magneto and Polaris. And there's some really cool stuff, as you would expect with, you know, these are, these are highly advanced scientific... Uh, knowledge they have this really and it's a really cool thing you know they're back against the wall they know they're gonna die so they inject themselves with this stuff that turns them into these ape-like creatures uh and it's man that's kind of that's what you would expect from from this is a conglomeration of hammer aim uh basically all of those shield aim hammer uh all of those those think tanks uh, those invention factories where they've, they've kind of gotten together and they realized they got a lot of scientists who were like, okay, it's not shield against aim against Hydra against this, you know, it's not that it's 
humans versus mutants, and they kind of devoted themselves to that. And so you see a lot of weird technologies like that, and um, that's the situation like that. So Magneto, there's one panel I want to point out. Um, I think this this new X Men series is sort of going to play out like a um, have kind of a Game of Thrones sort of a an alignment intrigue double cross uh, feel to it. And you're starting to see where the lines are drawn. You're starting to see the cracks. Um, Magneto says, you know, he tells them to go ahead and he'll take care of it. Uh, and he takes care of it in the most Magneto way possible. So, and they're, they're basically, they're doing something like, this is kind of what I thought, uh, I did a video about a year ago where I kind of suggested what the X-Men should be in this modern time. Sort of like a task force that goes, a task force without borders that goes and helps mutants in in troubled places like uh, Russia or North Korea or China, you know, where they might be exploited or they might be held captive and tested to be milled into a weapon. And that's sort of what this is. That's why they go there um, to clear this up. But there's a very, very interesting line. You start to see the division um, right here. The only gods on this planet stand before you here, child. This is, and then the next line, Cyclops says, that was faster than I expected. This is kind of like double speak. Um, and it's it's the sign of a very good writer. I think I think Jonathan Hickman's a very good writer. Um, Magneto thinks Scott was referring to the apes. Scott was actually referring to, this is what I think, this is, you know, this is conjecture. This is my hypothetical. That this is Scott pointing out. It took you. It took you less time than I thought to start calling yourself a god. And even this, you know, after this mission, it's very successful. Kind of goes back to you see the echoes of of uh, Aurora. She says, she you know, she says she's tired of fighting, but she'll never be tired of lifting up her own. And that's an echo of Aurora. And you see it later in this, you see echoes of Scott. Scott just wants this island to work. He wants this to be a safe haven uh, for mutant kind. He'll accept the walls. He'll, he'll accept the segregationalism to ensure that mutant kind survives. He'll do these things. He'll go on an offensive mission to, and, and kill people to ensure that mutants survive. But you see it a little more in the rift is these mutants, there's mutants on this island who cheer Magneto and, and want him to regale them with their story, with his stories. And, and they sort of treat him as, as a Messiah, as a God. And you see that as well in this. So these are the, and this is going to be a long story. This is going to be a long form. Um, these are the cracks that I think are starting to develop, to develop the ideological, uh, end point that they want. Magneto is being Magneto. He's echoing what he's always been. He wants to be homo superior, wants to be a god amongst and rule over humankind or wipe it out as, as you know, as a relic. And Scott has his motivations and somewhere in between all of the other ones are going to fall. And I think that's what this series, this X-Men, this new type of X-Men in 2019 is going to be. Is it's going to be a little more of that. Um, you go to the Orcus base and they, you know, they, this is gonna, I think these are gonna be the, the main boogeyman. I think these are gonna be their, their enemies because they should be. They're trying to create, uh, Mother Mold to create Nimrod. Uh, so there, you know, there's a lot of, just, there is a lot of talk, you know, after that, this is mostly talk and then there's more food stuff with, uh, you know, this is cooking a meal. Um, this is back on Scott apparently has a, uh, has a house on the moon. <laughs> That's, uh, that's interesting. That's cool. Okay. Um, you, you, you go have your house on the moon. But they're sort of having like a family meeting and they're all getting together. The Star Jammers, um, the X-Men who are either, you know, related to Corsair in some sort of way. Uh, and it's very, it's very neat. It's very touching and I kind of like it. But they even show this. I think this is going to be important at some point. Um, don't, don't ignore any of the little crumbs that uh, Jonathan Hickman writes. He's kind of a big brain writer. Um, there's reasons why he's showing you the layout. There's reasons why he's showing you where everybody lives. Um, right here, this is, this is the kitchen and this is the dining room. And this is, you know, as a chef, as a former chef, 
I can tell you this is wrong. Your dining room is always gonna be bigger than your kitchen. Your kitchen needs to be, and this is, I know, this is minutia, but your kitchen always needs to be um, 30 to 40% of the size of your dining room. They, they balance each other. They, they, they're dependent on each other. If you have a dining room that's a thousand square feet, you're gonna need a kitchen that's 3,000 or 300 to 400 square feet in order to service that dining room. Um, that's sort of, and then, you know, either way, it, it, it scales whether if the kitchen gets bigger, the dining room can get bigger. If the dining room can get bigger, the kitchen can get bigger and vice versa. Um, that's, but that's, that's just me nitpicking um, the design of this is your kitchen shouldn't be bigger than your dining room. It's weird. Um, but it's kind of has this touching thing where they're kind of talking amongst the family and it's really good. I'm going to skip the rest, but it's kind of cool. It's setting up Orcus at the end of this um, as a real threat because in this book you read, okay, the X-Men can just destroy Orcus, but then in the end of this book you sort of realize, oh, maybe they can't. Maybe Orcus has found a way um, to keep themselves from being killed and it's it's pretty interesting and it's once again it's set up i think uh this orcus project is going to be what is the main antagonist of this new uh this new mutant nation uh it's it's been interesting so far but i do have to say um where is it where's the list the part i don't like about this is this thing is is, is this was okay i excused it when it was house of x powers of x i considered them to really be just one big series with by that was bi-monthly that just happened to have two titles. Um, but when you go here and it's, this is your reading list. You know, you want, look at this, October. This is when these things come out. Look at that. And these are about $4.99 each. So Marvel, the powers that be, the big brains at Marvel, expect you to buy, let's see, uh, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. Uh, about $60 worth of comic books before November, before Thanksgiving, before ne November uh, 27. People don't have that type of money. And also, a lot of these books, these are, these are some pretty cool little cards that I got when I, when I bought this. Um, Fallen Angels, I don't like new, young, sexy uh, Cable. I'm, I'm not crazy about that. I think he's kind of forced on the fans um, in this new age. Uh, Brian Hill, he's a pretty good writer. I'll write that. I'll read that. X-Men, yeah, of course, I'll read that. Jonathan Hickman. Um, Jerry Dugan and Matteo Loli doing Marauders. You bet your ass I'll read that. Same with um, Hickman and Brisson doing New Mutants. You bet, yeah, I will definitely read that. Here's where it falls apart. You are out of your mind if I trust Marvel and Teeny Howard to do a good book. The Teeny Howard is... I think, you know, I think she's the diversity hire amongst these new books because all of these are written by men. And I think somebody at, at Marvel was like, oh, these are all written by men. We're going to get flack from that. So they brought in um, the, Mrs. Bland. She's the prom queen of Bland, uh, Teeny Howard. I, I've read a, quite a bit of her stuff. None of it has been interesting, fun, innovative, clever. It's just... A lot of blandness. Um, X Force. I will probably read. I don't think I've ever read anything from Benjamin Percy, but there's one problem, and there he is, Quentin Quire, the self, the SJW millennial hipster self insert character. I hate, and I generally avoid um, any book with him on there. But it's got Wolverine to kind of counterbalance. But we'll see. I mean, we'll see how much of this I buy. Like I said in, in, in a past video, I don't think you should go from something that may or may not be a hit to trying to sell me, what's that, six books a month. I don't think you should try that, Marvel. I think um, you're doing too much too fast. You need to establish this, maybe establish an X-Force, maybe establish New Mutants, um, and just go slow. But Marvel, Marvel's dumb. They go, they go for the quick money. Um, they go for the short money right now. But... That's all I got for this one. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for 15 minutes. Tell me what you think uh, about all this stuff. And it's Friday. Go have a good day. Go have a good weekend, all right? I know I'm going to have a good weekend. Bye.